Second part. To be honest, this is kind of a surprise. The man who'd introduced himself as Cray said frankly. I'd heard that anyone who got as far as Dee's room either walked off disappointed without even reaching for the knob, or else got carried out as a stiff. And that's because those clowns didn't even knock. And they just barged in with a sword or a pistol or whatever in one hand, said the hoarse voice. Then you mean to tell me my good manners saved my life? Cray donned an intimidating smile. D finally spoke. Say your piece. Cray stared at D, stunned once more. Blinking his eyes stupidly, he eventually came to grips with matters and composed himself, saying, I've heard all sorts of rumors about you. But I didn't know you did ventriloquism. Well then, it seems like a certain outlaw's grapevine is not all it's cracked up to- oh. Giving a light shake of the fist he just closed, and he gestured to a chair. He didn't say to have a seat, nor did Cray move. Moistening his lips with his tongue, he finally got down to business, saying, I want you to take me up Mount Shiloh with you. <clears throat> I can't. Dee's reply was terse. It left the man no footing at all. That's right. The hoarse voice interjected in a tone that sounded pained. We're the Bonafide Rescue Party, working at the village's request. If you want in, go get the village's permission. That's out of the question. Cray shrugged his shoulders. I thought as much. What with you being wanted for murder and all? A government official from the capital, and an innocent family of three. Cray of the dead man's blade has sunk pretty low, I guess. Disregarding the jibes of the hoarse voice, Cray won intent expression as he asked E. You got a spokesman working for you now? Apparently, he'd noticed the inhabitant of the hunter's left hand, and a pretty unsavory one at that. Want me to get rid of him? Cray's right hand turned with a flick of his wrist, and like a magic trick, a thin, double-edged knife lay in its grip. And the only explanation seemed to be that it appeared from thin air. Was this the famed dead man's blade? Don't worry. You won't feel a thing, and there won't even be any blood. Once the little nasty looking at it has died off, I could put your hand back where it belongs, and it'll move just the same as before. But only if it's within three days of it being cut off. Dee looked at his left hand. Is that so? He said. Don't do it! The hoarse voice shouted. Well, if the boss says it's okay. The knife spun in Cray's hand. With a shout... The left hand circled around behind the hunter's back. Whether Dee moved it or the hand moved itself was unclear. I wouldn't kill a fleeing man. Cray grinned wryly, making to put his blade away. He'd only been joking. I'd see your skill, Dee said. Cray's eyes glimmered. At that moment, the two men were no longer ordinary people. Are you sure? That's not the sort of thing to joke about. Let's see the dead man's blade. Devoid of expression, Dee's face was so beautiful and so chilling. This comes as a surprise. I'd heard you never let on about giving a rat's ass about anyone else. Cray's expression was intrepid and dangerous. Though it seems you make exceptions when it comes to exceptional abilities... Happy to oblige, Dee. This is what it meant to be a fighting man. The hunter didn't say he'd bring the man along if he displayed his skill, and the outlaw didn't even change his stance before launching his lanky form at Dee. The gleaming arc of his weapon, however, slashed the air an inch or more from the base of Dee's neck. He'd blown it. No, not exactly. The edge of that gleaming arc clung to the tip of the knife like a thread. At that moment, 
Cray's expression became as blank as Dee's. An unvoiced battle cry. The tip of the knife trembled, and the thread of light that hung in the air with it vanishing sped at Dee's shoulder as if hurled at it. Blood spurted out. I think that's far enough. That declaration came from the attacker, Cray. There was no triumphant ring to the words. He was holding his own right shoulder, and from between his fingers dripped blood. The weapon responsible was clutched in Dee's left hand, a knife with a foot-long blade, or rather, a dagger. However, considering that the two men were separated by almost 15 feet, it would be impossible to attack with that. There wasn't even any gore on its blade. The victim alone understood. So, you saw through my trick, did you? But I didn't even see it coming. That's the man called D, eh? What you just did now isn't all of it. D said while returning the dagger to the back of his belt. But I saw the dead man's blade, as promised. I get you. I thought about putting a little scare into you, but you're more than I can handle. But I don't give up, D. His knife spun. It vanished. Then reappeared. Cray's face turned toward the door, an intrigued smile rising on it. Got a visitor. As he said that, there was a knock at the door. A kid, said the hoarse voice. The knock had sounded tiny and diffident. D looked at Cray. Yeah, I know. Be seeing you. The knife master walked over to the door, grabbed the knob, and opened it. Come on in. On the other side of the doorway stood a boy who looked to be seven or eight. In stark contrast to his thermal coat, worn through in numerous spots, the boy looked cultured. Come on in. As Cray repeated his invitation, the boy stepped in without hesitation. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm D. As the boy looked up at Cray, his face showed expectation and anxiety, and was then suffused with joy. Just kidding. That's him over there. He's my brother from another mother. You know what that means? Yes, I know what it means. The boy replied with a nod. Your best friends, right? He had the voice and countenance of a clever child. That's right. Cray said with a grave nod. Then a shiver passed through him and he coughed once. Mr. D can be a, a hard one to deal with. He ain't the kind to hear requests too readily. Let me act as you go between. You want to climb Mount Schilla, don't you? Yes, the boy replied with a nod, his gaze alternating between Cray and Dee. Care to tell us the situation? Yes. <clears throat> the boy was going to nod a third time but he was cut short by the egregious supernatural aura. It was the same air that had just caused Cray to shudder and cough. This man has nothing to do with me. Also, no one can accompany me. If you wish to climb the mountain, do so on your own. I can't do it all alone, said the boy, effortlessly breaking through the shackles of Dee's unearthly aura. His weapon was single-mindedness. My father went missing while climbing Mount Sheila last winter. During the winter, they couldn't send up a search party. And when they did launch one in the spring, half of them disappeared just like my father, and they never did find him. Ever since, no one's gone up the mountain. Today, an uncle of mine who works in the town hall was good enough to tell me about it. I won't be in the way at all. I'll do whatever you say. I'll even search for my father by myself. Just bring me with you for the climb. Were you born around here? Dee asked, 
though he spoke in a tone like us. There was no unearthly aura to him now. Uh-huh. Oh, I'm Lurie, by the way. D. I'm Cray. When D gave him a hard look, the outlaw turned away despondently. Okay, okay. See you around, D. Raising a hand in farewell, he left the room. I... Uh, the boy was a bit to speak when D stopped him, waiting the span of a breath before walking over to the door. Although he walked normally, his footfalls made no sound. Grabbing hold of the knob, he pulled. There stood Cray, with one ear pressed to the door. As Dee gazed at him without a word, he smiled sheepishly and said, See ya. This time he did indeed walk away. Even after watching him descending the stairs, Dee didn't take his eyes off the man for a while. Finally shutting the door, he turned to Lurie and asked, As a local, you know about White Devil Mountain, don't you? Yes. Then you know how frightening the mountain can be. This isn't like climbing an ordinary mountain in winter. The boy's tiny frame suddenly seemed to shrink to half its size. D continued, All I know are the rumors, but on its peak stood the castle of one of the three most atrocious nobles in all their accursed history. Though the nobility may be destroyed and their castle fall into ruin, they say their ghosts still roam the mountains, draining the blood of any who would dare the slopes. The boy was speechless. Nor are the only thing that threatens climbers. There are tales of beasts and demons of the nobility's crafting. Various strange phenomena and mountain folk who live up there and feed on the monsters. You talk about searching for your father, but I don't think a child could accomplish that on his own. His tiny face turned toward the door. Did you think that if I climbed with you, I'd help you as well? Don't underestimate the mountain. His callous words were like an ice pick through the boy's heart. The boy gazed down at his feet for a long time. Then, looking up, he quietly made his apologies. Just before he turned his back to the hunter, he said, I'll see myself out. The door was open and closed again behind him, at which point the hoarse voice commented with admiration. That's one focused little brat. I thought he was going to squirt a few tears for us, but he left here with a composed face. I hope that's the end of it, though. The boy seemed to be gauging Dee's reaction. There's only one choice you can make, Dee replied. That interest was rare for him. You might even call it miraculous. To give up? I knew a gorgeous little brat once who'd never give up. It made me sick, and impressed the hell out of me at the same time. Kennedy reminds me a lot of that kid. Tomorrow morning we set off, Dee said, cutting the horse voice short. The mountain could be seen through the window. It looked for all the world like an ordinary snow-covered peak. Second part, end.